Okay. So, uh, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Upal Mahabub. I'm uh, serving as the chair of IEEE Computer Society San Diego chapter, and I'd like to welcome you to the ninth talk of our invited seminar series uh, for this year. Uh, today's talk is uh, co-sponsored by the uh, IEEE Robotics and Automation Society chapter, IEEE Communication Society chapter, IEEE Control System Society chapter, and IEEE Signal Processing Society chapter, and IEEE Photonic Society chapter of San Diego. Also, we have the Computer Society chapters of mm -hmm. IEEE Santa Clara Valley section, Hawaii section, Orange County section, San Antonio section, Dallas section, and uh, Galveston Bay section uh, as co-host. Uh, as well as the uh, EMBS Society chapter of IEEE San Fernando Valley, San Fernando Valley section. As always, we have Open Research Institute uh, in cooperation as our media partner for the entire series. Uh, and uh, Professor Rocha has given us consent to record the talk and upload uh, to our uh, YouTube and IEEE TV channel for later viewing. It is my great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Rocha once again this year, and he's from the University of uh, Campinas, Brazil. Uh, uh, Dr. Rocha is an IEEE fellow and currently serving as the director of the Artificial Intelligence Lab Record.ai and the Institute of Computing at Unicam. He is a Microsoft and Google Research Faculty Fellow and a recipient of the TCT Fellowship from Tan Chin Tuang Foundation in Singapore. Last year, he was ranked top 2% among the most influential scientists worldwide by research.com and, and Stanford Plus One. Professor Rocha is widely recognized for his work in the field of computer vision and pattern recognition, particularly in the areas of multimedia forensics and content-based image retrieval. He has more than 350 research publications cited more than 11,800 times according to his <laughs> His research focuses on developing innovative techniques and algorithms to analyze and understand visual data with applications ranging from image and video analytics to biometrics and information security. Uh, pro today, uh, Professor Rocha will talk about AI and how it is going to bring significant changes in our effort to ensure a healthier, more informed and trustworthy society. So without Further Edo, Professor, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, everyone, and thank you, Paul, for the invitation. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you all. Um, as you mentioned, uh, my work has been mostly uh, connected to trust and digital forensics, so I will touch upon some of these topics uh, today, but I will also show you some of the research that we have been doing here in the last uh, three, four years in health and well-being. Uh, that's why I gave the title of this uh, conversation as artificial intelligences, because I'm, I'm not a big fan of the idea of having one AI, uh, one AI for all uh, that would do everything for us. And some people even say that would replace us. So I don't believe this narrative, but I believe the narrative and the effects of uh, diverse solutions, custom tailored uh, for specific problems that really help us to solve those problems and to advance humanity. So that's why I call it artificial intelligences. Uh, and uh, I'm going to touch upon some. Uh, topics like opportunities, challenges, and problems uh, in these areas. So, just a bit uh, about myself. Uh, if you want to follow me on LinkedIn, please uh, take a picture of this QR code, and uh, I'm always uh, commenting on different aspects of AI. Uh, and uh, as uh, as mentioned here, I'm the coordinator of the Artificial Intelligence Lab uh, here at Unicamp. We started in 2009, so we are turning 15. Uh, this year, we started with four professors and three students. Yeah, that's the number three. Uh, back in 2009 in Brazil, not many people were interested in AI. But as you can see here, the number now is 300. So <laughs> it seems that something changed from 2009 
until 2024. And that's basically uh, AI really helping to solve problems and turning investments into profits, right? So um, I'm going to give you a quick definition of AI, what we do, uh, what's ahead. Uh, I'll comment upon um, synthetic realities, which is really related to forensics, and then some health and well-being. Everyone is talking about this, right? Everyone probably knows this picture here because it, sometimes it illustrates uh, some articles in the newspapers or magazines. It's about uh, AI conquering humanity and wiping us out of earth, right? Uh, and this is from how 9,000 from 2001 uh, Space Odyssey. Or sometimes it's like this, ex machina, um, that we will have the power to communicate with us uh, in such a natural way uh, that we will like um, deceive us to do things mm -hmm. that we are mm -hmm. uh, uh, in principle not prepared to do. So all of these are part of this narrative, um, mainly coming from Silicon Valley, um, that AI is so powerful that it will, by 2029, based on the predictions of Ray Kurzweil, that uh, we are going to be at the level of, uh, AI will be at the level of uh, us humans. I, I don't believe this. Um, and there are many, many uh, discussions about this. and. Uh, the lack of common sense, the lack, the lack of understanding in terms of causality and effect, but many other limitations. But this is the narrative that we normally see. And in addition to this, so what we are really having right now is what's called um, the evolution of the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, we all know that by 1760, uh, it all started to accelerate uh, with this team uh, machines and the industrial revolution, the first one. And then we had the second one by 1820, uh, with the industrial revolution related to electricity. And then by 1940s, we had computing and, uh, the explosion of computer science. In our case here in Brazil, our first, uh, computer science course was uh, created in 1969 and is the oldest in Brazil, but, uh, we know that in the U S, uh, we had some other courses of computer science created before that. But basically, computer science was developed uh, after 1940 and it took off. And then by the 2000, we had the fourth industrial revolution. But of course, this is uh, old news. Uh, what we have now is something bigger. We have something called convergence revolution. We have basically five key technologies that are called exponential technologies. And they are changing the way that we live. Uh, we, we call it GNR, IoT AI. Uh, G is related to genetics or biotechnology. And here we have examples of like uh, techniques to add DNA uh, to work with the RNA and others. An example of that is uh, CRISPR Cas9, that was the technology behind uh, the vaccine of Moderna and Pfizer BioNTech for COVID 19. And then, of course, it was uh, the alliance of um, CRISPR-Cas9 and AI that it was uh, that made it possible to find this vaccine. And the 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 name of convergence revolution is exactly because of that. These are exponential technologies in such a way that any advance in one of the five will also help to boost and to push developments and advances in the other four. So all of them accelerate each other. And it seems that they are converging to, to a common point. And this common point is basically uh, uh, related to everything that we do in the four letters, B, A, and G, uh, which stands for bank, uh, B of bits, A of atoms, N of neurons, and G of genes. So pretty much all industries right now that are revolutionizing um, new findings and new products are related to bits or to atoms, material sciences, for instance, or to neurons or to genetics. And then the second technology that is exponential in nanotechnology is nanotechnology. And this allows us to have sensors uh, put in places that we never imagined before. And this is exactly what I'm going to show you later. Uh, sensors that are put in a smartwatch that allows us to track 
uh, like 10 different types of diseases and help us to identify the early traces of such diseases. But uh, the evolution is not only in terms of the uh, miniaturization of sensors, uh, it's also in terms of the macro robots. If you go to the floor of a manufacturer, a uh, car manufacturing nowadays, it's like very, very dangerous uh, because it's pretty much populated by robots helping in the assembly lines. And all of these are connected and they are connected through sensors uh, uh, in the internet of, uh, of things. And they produce data all of the time. And all of the data that's produced is captured and processed and transformed in the into information and knowledge by artificial intelligence. These five technologies will be complemented in the years to come with two others, according to some studies. The sixth technology is going to be blockchain, uh, not the, the currency itself, but the technology behind it. So we are going to really be able to authenticate uh, multimedia objects, uh, contents, uh, to have smart contracts in the really smart uh, sense of the word and fast and then the seventh and last technology if it turns out to be really positive it's going to be uh, quantum computing or computers uh it's just two years to go uh, we we have some examples nowadays but they are like far from general purpose uh, uh use but if we can manage to work with that uh this is going to be the seventh ex exponential technology that we be uh, with these other six and this seventh will uh, complement, uh, complete the convergence revolution. So because of this, we all have this sense and this feeling that we are living in a moment that everything is happening everywhere all at once. Yeah, that's true. Everything is really happening all at once. And uh, we sometimes uh, have the feeling that we are missing something. And then the problem now is not having access to information, is is filtering the, the information that we need to process, right? And it's really detecting if what we are having access to is useful and it's real and it's not synthetic or created and if it's not uh, deceiving us somehow. So filtering is one of the most important problems nowadays because um, this is like a comparison between 1984 and, and uh, Brave New World. In 1984, we had the control of information. So people had limited access to information. On the other hand, in, in Brave New World, the information was uh, like free flow, but it was very hard to get exactly what you wanted because it was like an explosion of information. So what we have nowadays is kind of a mixture of both, right? Uh, we have access to the information, but it comes with like uh, several problems. And sometimes this information is monitored uh, by some big companies. So it gives also a feeling of 1984. So in this, in this uh, situation, we are, um, we are basically uh, living uh, with AI related to, to everything. So for our definition, uh, for our purpose here, AI is the ability of a system to correctly interpret external data, so data from the world, physical world, learn from, um, from this data to solve specific problems and use these capabilities to achieve specific objectives and tasks through flexible adaptation. So basically what I'm saying is that AI for us, it's not philosophical, it's not like related to some entity that will dominate us. It's basically engineering and mathematics. It's something that you develop in terms of an algorithm that will go to the world, get data, through sensors, work with this data, sometimes learn from it, create some rules, logic, represent this knowledge to help us humans solve specific problems, and then change the world somehow and adapt over time. This is basically it. But it's a constellation. It has like zillions of points. Um, and uh, in this map here, I'm going to give a zoom uh, soon. Each point is an area of interest in AI. Okay. The more to the center, the more developed and full fledged. The more to the borders, 
like uh, to the edges of the circle, it's something that's still being explored. It might turn out to be useful. It might turn out to be good. It might turn out to be bad. It might turn out to be useless, but it is still in, in its development stage. So let's see some examples. For instance, here uh, in this top left part, we have everything related to learning. So this is what people call machine learning. It might be supervised if you use examples that were annotated somehow. So you kind of develop a function that will follow specific examples that were annotated. It might be just to, de to devise and detect some patterns. So uh, when you want to find these patterns, these clusters, you're basically talking about uh, unsupervised learning. Or it might be related to some rules that you might uh, give feedback to the algorithm in a positive or negative way. So in, in a kind of reinforcement as you do with uh, dogs or children uh, when they do something interesting or not interesting. So this is reinforcement learning. And more recently, we also have examples of transformations that you can do to the data that you receive and automatically uh, create a function and update this function, which is called self-supervised learning. But the interesting thing here is that some of the points that were mentioned in 2020, when this plot, this graphic was created, really came out to be true in the, in the last months. So let's consider truth decay in the year, in an era of synthetic media. Four years ago, people believed more in newspapers and magazines and journals and publications. But as the AI developed, uh, we also saw some um, new techniques to help you create text, images, videos, audio, and all of these made this point here walk to the center. So now we are really seeing people uh, with less belief uh, in the media. So there is really a truth decay in an era of synthetic uh, media. And then the other point is before the Israel uh, war and um, the Russia war, uh, weaponization of AI was kind of far away. But now we have AI being used with drones and it's common. So we are also seeing the weaponization of AI going to the center. Another thing here is four years ago, people were discussing the possibility of the monitoring of mental state of a population. But in the last four years, this was pushed to the left. So now we have regulation, especially in Europe, in such a way that even emotion analysis is not allowed anymore. So at least for now, we are seeing that monitoring the mental state of a population is not going to the center, which is good. So if we move a little bit to the right, uh, we have uh, everything related to senses, the so vision, auditory uh, senses, um, and perception in general. So if you're talking about images and videos, we basically are talking about computer vision. Um, and here we have examples of understanding and recognizing objects and, and things. Um, and then we also have artificial senses uh, in such a way that you have like optics and, and other things. And if you go to the right, you can see there self writing software. It was not um, until 2022 that we had like chat GPT that allowed people do co piloting. So in 2020 self writing software was more like to the right and it was on the edges. But now we are going to the center with like a generative AI helping programmers to develop it faster. It's not actually self writing software, but it's like AI enabled software development. So we are seeing this, um, this development in general. Then when you go to the uh, bottom part, um, we can see here, for instance, brain computer interfaces in 2020, we didn't have uh, Neuralink, for instance, but uh, now we are seeing more and more investment in, in the development of uh, brain-computer interfaces, especially uh, to recover the motion for people that had uh, accidents, but also for people um, 
to enhance the way that they communicate with machines. It's possible that these sensorial implants will uh, increase in the, in the years to come. Um, we have also a development in terms of embodied AI. Uh, when we get this software and we brought uh, and we, we bring it to the world, so this is basically robotics. Uh, we have like even in the nano and in the macro scale, uh, but it's really more common now uh, to have um, AIs uh, embodied in, in the in the physical world. Indeed, if you are uh, if you sign the algorithm um, newsletter from the MIT Technology Review, uh, the one from this week is it's discussing exactly the explosion of investment in human, humanoid uh, embodied AIs. And then um, here we also have uh, data science, everything related to what was in the past business intelligence, uh, business analytics, uh, data mining, now it's embodied uh, in, this, uh, in this area of data science. And then finally, we have everything related to language. And, and basically here we have transformers, uh, we have like large language models, but nobody were talking about them in 2020. But now uh, they are like the, the main uh, talk of the day. Even if you go to a bar nowadays, people that do not understand AI, they're talking about GPTs and the, the latest prowess of uh, things that they did with uh, chat GPT. And uh, this is because people didn't have access to AI before. Now, pretty much anyone can have access to AI and interact with it and, and do funny things with it. And indeed, a recent report says, uh, analyzes the, the most uses of chat GPT, for instance. Do you have an idea of what's the first use of chat GPT. This is what is expected. Uh, people use chat GPT to get ideas, to, to help them develop ideas. But the second one is totally surprising. Uh, even, even Sun Altman did not anticipate that. The second most use of chat GPT is as a partner. And it, it might be a friend partner for conversation. It might be a love partner like a, a boyfriend or a girlfriend or someone to, to be with you when you are alone. So this is the second most use of, of chat GPT now, and, and people are inventing new ways of uh, working with that. So this is basically what we are living uh, with right now. And uh, what's changing around us? So what we have basically, it's like a, a, an environment of continuous learning. Uh, everything needs to be uh, updated all the time. If you go to school, you know that when you finish school now, um, you're going to need to keep studying the, the rest of your life. There is no way. Uh, for my parents, for instance, when they went to school, when they finished in university, for instance, they would say, okay, I don't need to study anymore. I'm going to find a job. I'll stay in that job forever. And that was common for our parents or our grandparents. But for us, most of the new generations, they think, oh, more than five years in the same job, that's not acceptable. And then uh, staying in the job without continuously studying, that's also not acceptable. You're going to be behind. So uh, this is one way that we are seeing things. So the conditions are very, very different. But we are also seeing conditions that uh, in AI nowadays that demand uh, solutions that are not just the answer anymore. It's not just like, I don't want to see an algorithm that will say yes or no. I want the algorithm to tell me yes or no, there is a possibility of a heart attack in this signal, but I want to see why and where uh, so that I can uh, work with a specialist to, to go there and see it. Um, I want explainable solutions. And with the uh, European AI Act, this is even more uh, um, so recently. And the same for Brazil, demanding uh, explanations and methods that are not biased and methods that were not necessarily trained uh, with all the classes of interest, which is called open set uh, recognition. But in AI, other things that change the way that we live, um, heterogeneous sensors, uh, so we are collecting data from the world with different sensors, but we need to combine them. Sometimes we have problems related to big data. Sometimes we have problems related to small data. 
Sometimes the sensors are unstable, unstable, and they don't work, and they still need to solve the problems. Sometimes we have missing variables. Sometimes the quality of the data is not that good. But regardless of that, great changes are coming. The first one I already mentioned, workplace. So in the past, we were we had like that person that would be uh, coming out of school, would not study anymore, and would be okay working alone. It's not possible anymore. It's very rare to find a person to go to a job nowadays that will be able to work by him or herself. So this person needs to work in communities. These, this person needs to work in groups, most commonly complementary groups, with people with different formations, different backgrounds, different stories. And they all need to study all the time. This, this is not something that you can uh, work around. It's a need. We are living in a crowd economy. I was giving this talk the other day and I was mentioned that some time ago, like 10, 15 years ago, it was very common for, uh, for that guy in your neighborhood to decide to open a business. This guy starts uh, a new business and he or she would be very happy when the whole city would know the business. This is very common for Brazil and, and, and Europe, for instance. But now, when they open the business, they are already thinking when they are going to conquer the state, then the country, and then the continent, like Latin America or, for, or the whole European Union, for instance. So this is a crowd economy. Uh, when the business starts, uh, the person already has a plan to, to, to go bigger. Uh, and in the past, it was like enough to conquer the city. Mass content generation, another thing that's completely changing around us. Uh, in the past, uh, let me talk about Brazil. We had two TV channels, like in 1980, 1990. We had like more channels, of course, but people would watch just two of them. Indeed, one with 85% of the population and the other with 10, and then the rest, all of the rest, less than 5%. So pretty much all of the content were generated by these two TV channels. Now, who generates the content? Everyone. I bet that at least half of the people in this audience today took at least one picture and posted online. This is the most common thing. So we are generating content all the time, images, videos, text, and etc. So we create the content and the algorithms distribute this content. Medicine. In the past, since the, the uh, government uh, um, of Hippocrates, medicine was reactive. People would feel some symptoms, go to a doctor, and then treat those symptoms. Now we have the possibility, more than ever, to do preventive medicine, to work with the, the health and well-being. So we can detect the signs that something is not good, that something is not normal, before actually this person has something more serious. And here is an example of what we do here in our lab. We are working, for instance, to detect bad quality of sleep. And bad quality of sleep is a proxy to many other problems. Hypertension is a proxy to many other problems. Diabetes. The more you analyze the signals coming from the human body, the more we see that it might be possible to detect early signs of diabetes, like, for instance, concentration of glucose in the blood, Without uh, interventions, just looking at the signals of the, the, the person, like electrocardiogram, um, the flow of the blood through infrared that you can analyze, many different things. But if we are really able to detect diabetes and the early signs of diabetes, this might be very, very important for the population. Another example, what is the disease of the 21st century? Anxiety, stress. So if we are able to detect peaks of stress or anxiety, then we can guide this person to go for, for a specialist. So this is a very important moment in terms of medicine because we are having the complement of like a, a 
millennia tradition of reactive medicine, reactive medicine, we are complementing that with preventive medicine. And then hyperpersonalization. This is like uh, one of the biggest changes in our lives in the last 10 years. So when you watch a TV 10, 15 years ago, one commercial would be for everybody. Even though less than 1% would be actually the target of that commercial, it would be um, general. Uh, everything was created for the masses, not personalized. But now everything is personalized. So if you do a search for a keyword in Google, and then you do the same search in the computer of someone else, the order of the results will be different because it's customized for you. So everything is hyper personalized. It, this might be good and it might be bad. It might be good, of course, because it's more targeted. So you can really get what you want when you are searching for something and when you want something. But it might be bad if you are not wanting anything and the, the, the companies keep pushing you to buy things, right? So it's a, it's a kind of a trade-off. And then, as I mentioned, when I compared 1984 with uh, uh, Brave New World, we have this data deluge uh, in which the problem is not finding information. The problem is to summarize it. The problem is to separate what's fake and it what's real. So we have this dichotomy. And it's, it's very interesting because our, our generation and the one before, uh, we grew up believing that an image was very, very powerful. And indeed, it's very likely that you heard the expression that one image worth is worth 1,000 words. This is like the, 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 the sentence that probably most of you have heard um, when you grew up. And then when we thought of like the courts of justice, it was very likely that these images could serve as proof of a crime, for instance. But now is the contrary. This generation that's coming, it's being raised in such a way that they will have doubts of any image they will see, any video that they will see uh, in their lives, they will have doubts about, uh, is this real? So this is something that's challenging us right now. What can we do to make sure that we kind of get back to the point that we can believe what we see? So we're going to need some technologies to help help us with authentication of these technologies to like give us the provenance of a, of a photograph, for instance, when we see it in a newspaper, and also to help us to detect if it's fake or not. So we, we need regulation, we need techniques, we have uh, the need of uh, standards to help us um, analyze and, and have access to this content. Because nowadays I can tell you an image is not anymore worth a thousand words. It's more like one image might be worth a thousand lies. It's very likely. Continuing here, we, we, as I said, we have a new concept of teamwork. So we, we have teams that complement each other. This is very important diversity because the problems are much more complicated. So we need people from different background. And even the mobility in, in urban centers, they are very, very different uh, nowadays. I cannot move around Sao Paulo, for instance, without Waze or any other GPS uh, software nowadays, because I don't want just the minimum path from point A to point B. I want information about the traffic. I want information about the quality of the roads. I want information um, about the weather, everything in one, one um, app, and it helps a lot. So even mobility has changed. And if everything is going to AI, it's of course related also to insurance and finance. Uh, when you calculate now uh, the price of an insurance, of course, uh, not only that object will be evaluated, everything around it will be evaluated. As, as an example of that, uh, in the past, when you asked for an insurance of a car, basically what would be analyzed would be the history of that car and the history of yours as a driver. But now, we have many other uh, side data that can be analyzed by these companies. Like even your profile in social media might be analyzed and you don't even know. And to finalize this part, 
we are moving to a, a situation of each citizenship. So uh, I'm not sure how it is in the US right now, but I guess it's pretty much the same thing. But in Brazil, most of the government services are now online. So my surprise was like three or four weeks ago uh, when I needed to renew my driver's license, a process that the last time five years ago, I needed about a week to get my new driver's license when I visit the office. Now, I did not even need to visit the office. I just authenticated uh, through the Gov, uh, the Gov app. And it saw that my driver's license was about to expire in two weeks. I just click it, uh, ask it for a renew. They collected my biometrics uh, face, uh, did the face recognition. And then they asked me to just update my fingerprints. I went to the office the other day, updated my fingerprints, and in 24 hours, I received my new driver's license. This is uh, something that I was surprised about. This is really good. So we are moving towards this, uh, this e-citizenship. So you have more power to press the government, to follow what the government is doing, and also to request services uh, in an efficient way. So this is what's happening around the world um, with the convergence revolution. And in health, it's not different. So uh, I study from Deloitte uh, or Deloitte, um, shows that AI can have a significant social impact um, on European health systems. Uh, and this goes from uh, wearables to new systems for imaging, to techniques in the labs, uh, monitoring of patients, uh, analysis of real world data, uh, virtual health as assistance, and even personalized apps and robotics to help in, in the hospitals. And this is, Particularly true for uh, cardiology when we have systems to help analyze signals, data. Chatbots, detection of cancer, um, personal health companions, radiology, and even chatbots. If we go for a quadrant analysis, we can have systems to help in the patient care. So assisted or automated diagnosis, for instance, real time prioritization, prioritization of, of patients in the hospital and triage. So if you go, if you go to the hospital with a simple belly ache, and another person is going there with like a, a serious back ache, it's, it might be possible that uh, this back ache is related to kidney ache, which is very very serious. So this could help triage the patients and, and get the, the ones uh, in more urgent care uh, to have actually the, the, the care they need. And uh, we also have new systems to help uh, diagnose uh, diseases, so medical imaging and diagnostic. Um, we also have systems to help in the development of new drugs, uh, new medications, uh, and uh, comparisons of uh, these medications to see which one is more effective. And then a nice example here, I, I'm not sure if you saw it, but uh, about three, four months ago, if I'm not mistaken, it might be a little more, uh, a new antibiotic was discovered with the help of AI. And it's very, very important because um, the antibiotics that we have nowadays, they are not being that effective anymore because people are using them more than they should. So the bacteria uh, are turning into super bacteria. Um, so discovering new antibiotics is very in interesting and important. And this uh, AI algorithm discovered a new antibiotic that's now under test. So it's, uh, this is the way that AI is helping us in general, the society. And all of this needs to be in the context of diversity uh, and, and bias analysis and explainability. And also, as I mentioned, we know what we need to be able to separate what's good from what's bad. And it comes the concept of synthetic realities. So when you have people trying to create this alternative narrative with a context and some AI enabled media to try to deceive you into believing into something. And as Arthur C. Clarke uh, warned us, uh, Years ago, 
we might, we should not look at these technologies as magic. Because, as he said, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. But we don't want to look them as magic. We want to see them as they are. They are mathematics. And if they are mathematics, we can change them. We can update them. We can demand regulation. So we have data as never before. And for instance, here is an example of uh, an image that was created with the help of AI. And this is, was part of a art competition in Colorado uh, a few years back. And the guy, Jason Allen, won the competition. And he won the competition. And after winning the competition, he confessed that he created it with Mid Journey with about 800 uh, prompt editions and interactions with Mid Journey. People are surprised and sometimes outraged that he created that, but I see it as he is the artist because it's like 800 uh, interactions, uh, interactions uh, with Mid Journey. And this result is actually what he was trying to get. That's why he interacted so many times. We also have the creation of like fakes. Uh, this is an example of Morgan Freeman. No, it's not Morgan Freeman. This is the face of Morgan Freeman, uh, and uh, I'm not going to give you the video, but this is also the audio of Morgan Freeman, and it looks like Morgan Freeman, but it's a deep fake. And this is not even the state of the art anymore because this is like from three or four years ago. More recently, we had the launch of Firefly, which is a software made by Adobe, and it allows you to edit images uh, as never before, uh, just as uh, Quick overview of what it does. Take a look. So now you can look at the image and you can imagine like a play though uh, for children. You, you, you mess around with the image the way you want. So that's why uh, I told you before that uh, it's more like uh, an image is like uh, 1000 lies than 1000 words, right? And then here's the same for me journey V5. You can pretty much do anything you want. So all of these creations are now part uh, of like even Hollywood. So years ago, it was very, very expensive. If you imagine James Cameron took like 10 years to do uh, Avatar, right? Um, and I bet that he would be able to do it faster now uh, with all of these AI uh, technology. And uh, we have like these technologies for images, for videos, uh, even for text. And the, for text is even more advanced now with chat GBT. And it's changing a lot. Um, education, it's changing uh, code development, uh, entertainment. Um, and it's changing the way that we do things in, in a daily basis. And if you're not using chat GPT or something similar, you're behind. I'm sorry to say that, but that's the truth. I'm, I'm learning French, for instance, and I can start to chat GPT and talk to chat GPT, asking it to, to pretend to be a French talking to me. I'm not saying typing, I'm saying talking. And then I ask, oh, I want to talk to you for 10 minutes in French. I'm currently B2 level, intermediary, up intermediary. And I want to, to challenge me in, in, in becoming better. But at the end of the conversation, I want you to prepare a report where I was bad, where I was good, how can I improve? And then I do these sessions of 10, 10, 10, 10. And it's, I, I'm very surprised. I'm very happy with the results. I, I'm, I'm learning a lot uh, with this way. And I, I'm doing this with French, but you can do that in different ways. I, I gave a talk recently in a, in a school of medicine, and then we were discussing how to use ChatGPT to create like a clinical case for each student in the room. 
because you can adapt. If this student in particular wants, wants to be a radiologist, we can like create a, a clinical case for this student to work for that class in a radiology case. So it allows you to quickly adapt to the, the, the teaching and, and it's very important. And at the same time, it's very dangerous. If you do not criticize it and use it in a critical way, it might be bad. So these are new times. That's why I told you before, we have the feeling that everything is happening everywhere all at the same time. And the same for videos. Look at this. This is a result of Sora. It's a very good result. So summarizing this part, I'm going to quickly show you uh, in two minutes a project called Viva Bain in English is Live Well. So the idea is to promote health and well-being. So we want to innovate and disrupt research. Uh, disrupt, we want innovative and disruptive research in AI so that we can monitor uh, the health of an individual, work with preventive medicine, and develop techniques that allow these people to go for specialists when they see something uh, offbeat or wrong. So we work with smartwatches, a word of sensors. So these word of sensors is like we are talking about accelerometer, barometer, gyros, geomagnetic sensor, light sensor, optic heart sensor, and many others. And we collect this time series of different sensors and we analyze them uh, in terms of like uh, what's related to neuroscience, physical education, what we can do in terms of AI, what we can do in terms of explainable AI, and then we want also to do translation of this research um, to possible apps that could be use, is useful for, for the people. And everything, of course, needs servers so we ran this into one of the largest uh, ai centers uh, in latin america in a partnership with a company um and it's like one of the 500 most uh, efficient computers in the world um equivalent like to 2 million laptops so in this uh, research we work with 10 fronts uh, one of them is detection of, and analysis of motion. So if people are having problem with, problems with motion. Uh, activity identification, if the person is eating or not, or walking, and if it, the person is eating is nice, because then we can go for another front of the, of the research that tries to uh, estimate the quantity of glucose in the blood. We work with uh, monitoring sedentary behavior. Uh, currently, we are submitting a paper uh, with our latest results. We detect sedentary behavior with more than 94% accuracy. And I'm not talking about separating a person that's sedentary. Sedentary is the normal person that we, we know that never does any kind of sports. Sedentary behavior is a person that sometimes walks, sometimes runs, sometimes swims for one hour a day, and then sits for 10 hours. This person is at risk of a heart attack, the same way of a person that's a complete sedentary, because this person thinks it's safe because there was the practice of sport for one hour, and it's, it's false. If you stay seated for 10 hours straight, then you are in trouble. So that's what we try to identify and then to tell this person, okay, you need to do something, stretch, walk, do something because you have sedentary behavior. We try to work with uh, sleep disorders, uh, diabetes, hypertension, and even mental saturation and emotional tension. So this is uh, the uh, framework of what we're trying to do in our center uh, for uh, health and well-being. This is complementary to my research in trust. Uh, in our lab, we have basically three fronts of work. One is health and well-being. The other is trust. I'm most known for trust because I did a lot of algorithms in the past and continuous, continuously do algorithms in this line. But I also work with health and well-being. And there is a third, uh, which is energy. And I didn't bring uh, here today. So let me show you an example of what we do. Here is an example of like the, the analysis of motion. 
We collect all of this data in partnership with the hospitals. Um, we have uh, volunteers to participate. So we have like the international protocols for them. And then we collect the data with these different sensors to try to understand motion. And uh, in the end, the idea is that uh, we see if there is any problem. For instance, here we collected like different activities for like hundreds, uh, at least 100 uh, participants. Dancing is one of the examples. Brazil is Brazil, right? So everybody dance. So uh, we want to understand how dance helps people. We collect yoga and uh, we want to analyze uh, if a yoga session will help people to be less stressed. So we collect before, during, and after yoga. And then we try to understand uh, how it is uh, the motion in general. Then we collect also sedentary behavior activities like watching TV, uh, just working in the office and things like that. And we also analyze the response of the, the brain uh, to uh, these activities. So we, we have in partnership with the, the, the physics and the, the medicine schools, uh, we also analyze the areas of the brain that are activated in the different activities. So here's an example of a data collection. So the person sleeps in the lab. So sleeping in the lab is not bad. It's also part of science, okay? So this is uh, the, the lesson that we give students here. As long as you are sleeping in with this helmet, you are okay. <laughs> Very good. This is the area that are active um, when the person is awake and then light sleep and then ran. This is uh, the activations when the person is like with mental saturation uh, in our studies. And then we analyze, for instance, the brain activity, bloody pressure, heart rate, exhaled CO2, electrocardiogram. Then we compare the different groups, person that uh, is not in mental stress and uh, with mental stress and so on and so forth. And then the same thing for, for other activities. So if you want to learn more, uh, just type vivabain.unicamp.br. Uh, there is an AI behind it, so you can translate to uh, 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 other languages, okay? And uh, also record.ai, it's also, there is an AI behind it if you want to learn more. To finalize, let's get real about AI. It's here, it's not going anywhere. We need to adapt, we need to use it, we need to be critical. Thank you very much. I'm open for questions and I hope you like it. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Professor uh, Rocha. It was a, a wonderful talk. Uh, I, so I request the attendees to please like unmute yourself and directly ask uh, your questions to the professor. Uh, on the chat, I see uh, uh, a comment, a question from uh, Mauricio. Uh, would you like to uh, ask it directly to the prof? Or... Okay, so he said, sometimes I think about how few people and many companies are developing AI, while the vast majority of people live in an environment of <laughs> natural stupidity, uh, stupidity <laughs> diminishing their analytical and logical information processing cap capacity. Capacity. Okay. So technologies evolve much faster than our democracy or our social systems, such as education, work, profession, and healthcare. Uh, I know we should not fear the unknown. This is for the basis for new scientific discoveries, but I think allowing these discoveries to be funded by private institutions could influence and unbalance the direction of discoveries and the benefits for the general population. We have many problems that AI could help improving uh, help improving people's quality of life instead of exploiting them financially. Is it possible to think of some kind of protection or limits to the application of artificial sciences following social or even philosophical rules such as ethics? Or are we already at a time when it is no longer possible to impose controls except the individual limits of imagination 
uh, curiosity, knowledge, desire, uh, perversity of the people who develop the model. So yeah, it's a big comment with some questions for you. Yeah. So. Okay. Thank you. Uh, very, very nice, um, very nice comment, uh, Mauricio. Um, yes, it's possible. And uh, we need to have this in mind. People think and they try to see uh, AI as this, like a powerful entity and sometimes attribute some divinity to it and some magical powers to it. There is no magic. So when, when people ask me if I think that uh, AI will dominate us by itself and not people behind AI to dominate us, people behind AI to dominate us, this is very likely, this is how humanity evolved, right? So we also need to deal with that. But AI by itself dominate us? I don't think so. At least not in the short term. Think about this. The most advanced AI that we, we have nowadays is large language models. Large language models rely upon three matrices. Three matrices. Big matrices, but matrices. And everything they do is matrix multiplication. So I ask you back. Think about matrix multiplication in the in the, the high school. Do you think that matrix multiplication will dominate us? I don't think so. So basically what's happening there is matrix multiplication. So there is no way that matrix multiplication will dominate humanity. But people behind it might. And then going to your question, I really think that we can steer the development of AI. And that's really what we are doing. Think about this. Five years ago, people were not asking for regulation or understanding of the algorithms. Now it's something very common. So we, we do not just trust algorithms anymore. We want explanations. I don't want to go to the bank and the computer says, your loan is denied. I want to know why. It's my, it's my right to know why. So I, want, I, I demand an explanation for that. So I think that we can steer the development of technology and the more critical we, we are, the more we can request. So that's why for me, the most important thing that we can do is to invest in education. So when people are educated, they will understand, they will seek to understand, they will be critical. So for me, it's, a, it's a, an effort for education since uh, like a kindergarten uh, and for life. Uh, so we need to work in education. Thanks. I think Bob has a question. Bob, please go ahead. Yeah. I really enjoyed your, your presentation. So, so I saw uh, two quick questions. So one, the first question is, did you generate that map that showed the areas of AI? And then secondly, if you look at that map, as you look at that map of, uh, of AI and the different areas of research, are there any areas that you look toward as areas of concern? You can imagine, you know, like nuclear codes or something or some sort of infrastructure with regards to nuclear arms. Yeah. Very good. The question uh, is the map is the area areas of AI. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Uh, thank you for being here and for the questions. First. The map was generated by Imperial College London uh, three or four years ago. Um, I will share, uh, uh, Upao is uh, recording this, but if you want specifically the PDF for that, you can send me an email or go directly to Imperial College. I can happily share that. Um, and yes, there are areas of concern. One of them, of course, is the use of AI for weapons, uh, military weapons, autonomous weapons. And we are not talking about just one specific country using that. Uh, you know that there are these uh, technologies, easy access uh, online, so people can just buy some drones and attach to it some face recognition uh, technology and do weird things. I, I'm not talking about uh, black mirror things. I'm talking about things that are really possible to be done right now. And this is one thing. But uh, recently we did uh, some analysis um, and it's also possible to use these large language models to do some, to have access to some codes. So people can create worms, virus, uh, they can work around the protections, uh, and this is a matter of even national security. 
Um, so I think that uh, we really need to be critical and be uh, watching uh, the development of these techniques. That's very important when we have um, uh, companies like Meta to to make to, to make that make these models available, so people can uh, really delve into uh, into the details uh, of these models. Um, I'm not a big fan of companies that have everything uh, closed doors, so we cannot like uh, analyze it. But this is how we are going to live in the years to come. Some others will be free, some others will be closed. And then, as a university, for instance, we need to to help the society to understand these models, to be critical, try to see if there is any uh, backdoor or, or injection attack or things like that. Because we already know that's possible to use this kind of technology to generate, as you mentioned, uh, worms and and, and viruses and, and other things. So it's a matter of uh, security. Thank you. Thank you. Any other question? Uh, other quick question. Uh, so, Professor, I was listening to this, uh, like, recently released uh, lecture from uh, 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 Dr. Grace Hopper, uh, the famous uh, computer scientist, and she was talking, like, in 1984 about the value of information, like, how to, and she was mentioning, like, not enough, at that time, there was not enough research on, like, to evaluate or understand which information is valuable and which is not. So with the AI, I always have this fear that whether it understand the value of certain information, like what, how to prioritize things, because sometimes this is also data driven. Uh, right. So what's your thought about that? Yeah, uh, I don't think right now um, we have AIs that have embedded the ca capacity to select the information that's more interesting than others. Because as I mentioned, the, the best AIs that we have, they are really good in, in into doing, uh, they are really good at doing comparisons and finding correlations, but they are terrible in common sense. They are terrible in causal analysis. So right now they are not there yet. We might have better models in the years to come, but here's an example. So the last version of uh, ChatGPT, for instance, if you ask it something like, I go to my basement that are windowless and I look up and I see, and then you put three, three little points. And then ChatGPT completes. I see a beautiful sky and it's a poetic night. Of course, it's not possible to see uh, uh, the sky because if you're in the basement, it's windowless. So if you look up, you're going to see your roof, right? <laughs> so uh, there is no notion of uh, causal, causality or, or common sense in, in these technologies. But then uh, uh, I already checked it, uh, GPT-4 and 4.0 fixed this. So if you do this very example there, uh, it, it says uh, something related to your roof. Um, so not, not the stars, um, but, uh, there, there are some computer scientists like, um, uh, Andrew Ng that advocates for, for better data so that we use less data to train models in a better way and more efficient way. Um. And I think that this is one of the paths that we might go in the future uh, to have uh, specialists to help sifting through these big quantities of data to get what's more significant to have a diverse coverage of the, the problem instead of just ingesting data from everything from everywhere. <laughs> so I think that we are going to have the two ways, uh, models that we will keep like getting data from everywhere and then other models that will be more efficient and, and uh, trained it with uh, sifted uh, filtered data. I see. Uh, so one last question I see on the chat. Uh, oh, actually, uh, Ambrose, do you have a question? Uh, we can't hear. I don't, I cannot hear. Yeah. 
Uh, Amrul, unfortunately, uh, we can't hear you. Uh, uh, can you, you can type the question if you can do that on the chat, that would be good. Uh, I have see a question from Chandra. Yeah, please go ahead. And ask. Hey, well, uh, uh, thanks for giving the opportunity. So, uh, thank you for the demo, first of all. I did impress on the way which was presented. Um, I have a question regarding, is there any uh, predefined AI models can use cross domain areas. Like, you know, there are so many AIs that been, I've, I'm in the IT industry working for 23 years on different AI, more, AI models and machine learning and all. But every domain, they're using a different, different set of models and train the models and getting the out of insights. Is there any algorithm where we can generate common data model and train the uh, the the uh, the uh, data sets, sample data sets. To I mean, on the fly, we can answer the the executed decisions. Yeah. So yes, um, we we basically had in the last years the uh, appearance of models that like were very good for text, like ChatGPT, very good for images okay. like uh, Mid Journey and. Um, and Dali, uh, Chu, Dali 3. But now we are seeing models that are cross modality. So now we have, uh, we are seeing models that work with text and images. And then it's very likely that uh, in the next months or, or uh, one or two years, we're going to have models that work like images, text, audio, and video at the same uh, uh, framework. Because um, basically we learned it how to translate an information from the physical world to a vector space. Yeah. And then once, once you're in a vector space, it's a matter of pushing them to be close together. What I mean by that is that if you have a way of transforming a sentence to a vector space, to a vector representation, and then an image that is like basically described by that sentence, and you transform this to the vector space, then if you have a way of putting these two vectors close together, you are finding a way of tying the sentence to the image. So what we are doing now with cross models is like that. You have a text that describes an image and then you transform them to the feature space and then you force them to be close together because they are talking about the same thing. So if you have an audio, you can do the same thing. If you have like a video, you can do the same thing. So, so the new ways that people are training these models, they, they have like in, as input the different modalities. And then with the different modalities, they transform to vector space and they work there with self-supervised learning to put them close together or far apart if they are from different concepts. So yes, uh, I think that uh, in the years to come, most likely we are gonna have uh, multi-modality models uh, more common. Okay. Does that, uh, does that support not only from on-premise is a kind of a irrespective of the multi-cloud environment or so is there any environment specific kind of models? Um, the ones that I know, uh, they were developed, uh, they are developing Py uh, Python and PyTorch. So basically it's just a way of transforming them to a vector space. So I would say that they are not specific to a technology because we are talking about mathematics. So if you, if you have a way of uh, receiving an image, an audio piece, or or a text piece, and do some operations in in, in those objects and transform to a vector space, it's it's math. So you can do it with PyTorch, TensorFlow. It doesn't matter. Thanks, thanks, Andrea. Yeah. Thank you. It makes sense. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thanks everyone for attending. With that, I think we can uh, call it a day. Thanks once again, Professor Rocha. And if thanks uh, a lot. So yeah, I think there are still some additional questions. So please reach out to Professor Rocha and ask uh, maybe on uh, on LinkedIn. And I, uh, so and also uh, I'll reach out to you uh, later on about the book chapter. And <laughs> so so we talk about. That. All right. Thanks a lot, uh, guys. Yeah. Thanks. Bye. -bye. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.